In this video, we're talking about the struggles of a rental arbitrage host and what you can expect, so stay tuned. Vacation Rental Machine helps hosts just like you learn how to start, grow, and scale your short-term rental business. This show is all about creating systems that help you automate your business, giving you more time and money freedom. If you're ready to start living the vacation rental life, then subscribe to this podcast today. Come and join us on our Facebook group, The Host Nation, where we'll be talking about starting, automating, and scaling a short-term rental business. Now, on to the show. Hey, welcome back, Coast Nation, to another episode of Vacation Rental Machine. I'm Julian Sage with John Bell. John is currently in Miami building out six properties right now. By the time this video is probably going to be released, uh, we're going to have another three that we're building out down there, plus one in another location. Uh, so properties just kind of popping up all over the place. Uh, but with that, there are some unique struggles that this business, you know, building out these uh, rental arbitrage master lease properties has that maybe people don't realize. So, John, with your experience now building over 50 properties, um, what are some of the biggest struggles that even to this day that you still face? Well, you know, one of the, the biggest problems that every host, not just rental arbitrage host, any host, it, it's going to be people. People could include cleaners. People could include assistants. People could include anybody that you're actually going to need to work with. You know, there's a lot of hosts that are doing it full time and they're the heartbeat of their own company. They do it all and nobody else can do it like them. Right. Finding somebody that can actually do cleaning up to a certain standard sometimes is very, very, very hard. And for us as a rental arbitrage host going to a new city, trying to find people, it's really the interview process. I mean, you know, there's so many people that you get a, to apply. You tell them to meet. You windle everything down. Let's just say there was 50 people that applied. 10 people show up for an interview. You might say, hey, I want to do a demo day of cleaning or whatever. And maybe two people show up. It's like people just self-sabotage themselves in a sense. And that's what we've experienced here to the point in which we weren't able to hire cleaners. We actually had to go out and find a contractor. And that still sometimes is a struggle because you might hire a contractor and they don't really clean good. Like you have a whole cleaning business, but yet you cannot clean. You left stuff in the tub. You can't remove hair from the apartment. This is our biggest thing. So we need to figure out ways to resolve it. Uh, of course, we talk about how to resolve certain things uh, by processes and actually instruction. Not every cleaner is a bad cleaner. They just need to know how to clean up to your standards. That's one thing. So don't go firing people just because they didn't clean it pro properly. You want to just give them the skills and techniques to do it the way that you want them to do it. People are definitely one of the hardest things to find and keep. I think you brought up a really good point, John, that just because someone maybe doesn't know how to be able to clean a place or be able to take care of a place doesn't mean that you should just let them go. Sometimes you just need someone that is really accountable. If someone is accountable, they're able to show up on time, they're responsive and they're eager to work with you. You know, it's more about the character qualities of that person as opposed to their skill set. There is a difference that you do need to make if you are going to be training someone versus if you're going to be hiring them as 1099 versus w2 but if you are going to be having someone try to meet your standards it's okay to be able to show them like hey this is what our standard is for our business these this is what we expect we expect you to be able to do this on your own we're not going to teach you how to do it but this is what our standard is if you can meet that standard we're willing to work with you so the second struggle is verification. So when you are going through the process of finding properties, whether that is for co-host clients or if you are picking up rental arbitrage, master lease units, verification, visual verification is an important step because you might be going through and, you know, cold calling people or going through a list and just trying to, you know, see which type of people would be able to work with you or, um, you know, maybe you are just trying to find properties. And you might find a property. Let's say you see an apartment or you see someone that has a property listed that you'd be able to like to manage for them. And you just think like, OK, I can take this property or I can take this client and everything's going to be good. But visual verification is a big step because just because someone says I have a property, can you manage it for me? Or I have a property that I 
you know, I'd let you to be able to, you know, uh, furnish and, you know, hold a mass release on doesn't mean that it might always be the best case or doesn't mean that you should take them on without having done some visual verification. So, John, do you want to give an example of some experiences that you've had when you thought everything was really, really good until you actually placed eyes on the place? You know, uh, the, the best example I have is actually walking into this place here. Um, for those of you that don't know where I'm in Miami right now and I'm building out six units, we were told that the properties were all furnished, fully furnished. And uh, we went on a video tour of a couple of apartments. Those couple of apartments look like they were the most furnished out of all of them, but actually signing for all of the apartments and getting here, there were other apartments that were missing a lot of things. So uh, in a sense, because we didn't get a walkthrough of all the units, we didn't see that. We didn't know exactly what was there and what wasn't there down to the plates, the bowls, all of that stuff. One of the other things that we didn't see is the actual condition of some of the patio spaces that were here. We seen photos of what it looked like very nice, but when we got here, there was a lot of overgrown uh, things. So that stuff needed to kind of just be looked at. It's, it's a big lesson learned. And this is why I say, you got to go out, you got to meet the landlord, you got to walk the property. Sometimes I go to a place like a big REIT and I walk in and I just see the place and I see how even to get up to the apartment, if I know my guests are going to have trouble getting up to the apartment, I don't even need to bring up what I'm there for because I know it's just a no go. Now, we can go find nice apartments that we all want to put people in and we want people to stay there, experience all of these amenities. But if you really don't go and experience it yourself to see how much of a burden it actually is, then you're actually just not doing yourself any favors. You're actually hurting yourself and your business. One of the last things I'll say about this is you need to stay at your unit. You actually need to stay. If you're anticipating that people are going to come and stay 10 days or more, I would suggest that you stay at your unit for 10 days. It's a hard thing to do, especially just trying to get revenue in, but you'll learn so much about what you're missing and why you need to purchase certain things just from that one thing. For me, sometimes I have to replace the shower heads because the shower just isn't pleasing enough. I know my guests would like more pressure. So I go out and I get it. After me staying there, that's when I find out all of this stuff. I also can put together a maintenance list of stuff that needs to get fixed. That was also one of the things here that we needed to do is put together a list of things that don't work. Hey, this light does not work. I flick the switch, it doesn't work. You don't find that out until you actually stay in a place. You can try to go through a checklist, but you'll never really get the full experience. You don't want your first guest to tell you if the oven doesn't work. We don't go through and test ovens. Yeah, I think it's important that, you know, a lot of people, they might look at this as just like a hospitality business or they might just look at it, this as a real estate, but it really is a blend of both. There is a big factor of real estate, real estate. You have to touch it. You have to feel it. You have to go there. You have to put eyes on it. But then there's the hospitality aspect where you're, now you're actually staying in the property. You're trying to experience what it's like and you're trying to make sure that the person that is in that piece of real estate is going to have a pleasurable time. So that's what makes this business really unique and is also one of the biggest struggles with this business because you might not be real estate focused or you might not be hospitality minded, but you do have to put both of these things together in order to create a really nice experience. And the last struggle is trash. So John, what is your experience with trash and how do you handle, you know, let's just say six units with hundreds of boxes, hundreds of things, that's a lot to deal with. Yes. Creating trash is one of the things that we do. Luckily, most of it is recyclable, but we create trash. Imagine six apartments full of furniture that's all shipped or bought in that comes in a box. That cardboard needs to go somewhere. Where does it go? You can't put it normally down just unless there's a dumpster down just the trash can and just expect it to go away. 
literally we had a mountain of just cardboard that we had here that we just accumulated from all the stuff that's coming in. There's just no way around it. You're going to accumulate trash in two phases. In the build out phase, you'll accumulate a lot. The second phase is your guest. Your guests are gonna come, they're gonna stay. They're probably gonna buy stuff at the grocery store. Well, the stuff that they purchase at the grocery store is gonna get thrown away before the next guest comes in. That's a lot of trash. You're gonna need trash cans. You're gonna to need to figure out a way to either get rid of stuff as it accumulates, or you need a process to help get the trash out of the house, tucked away so it's not messed up by animals while it's sitting out on the street. One of the ways that I help get rid of boxes is I actually went and created a Facebook listing, marketplace listing that says free boxes. Why did I do that? Because I got plenty of boxes. Literally somebody just came by and picked up 40 boxes and I still had to call somebody else to come and remove the boxes. And I paid 70 to $80 for this person to take away the trash. That's just how much trash we accumulate. It is a big problem. That's why it deserves to be in this list, creating trash. We do that. Luckily it's recyclable. Yeah, it's a big problem. So question of the day, what are some of the biggest struggles that you face in your short-term rental business? Leave it in the comments section down below. And until next time, Host Nation, keep on hosting. If you'd like John and I to answer your guys' questions, then be sure to go to the Host Nation Facebook group and use hashtag AskBRM. Hope you hosts found value in this episode. If you did, please go on over to iTunes and leave us a review as that would greatly support the show. If you'd like to connect with John, the community, and I, then go on over to our Facebook group, The Host Nation. Talk to you hosts in the next episode. Keep on hosting.